So, Steph, yeah. we ran in the J.P. Morgan Corporate Challenge last night at oh. Central Park. Oh, you and Jim Labenthal. Oh, did he? Yes. I didn't see him there. Um, he was probably way ahead of me. So, <laughs> so we had 20 runners. And wow. we came in 197 globally out of 1,700 uh, companies that ran all over the world. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And it's night two, it's night two tonight, so we might get pushed back a little bit. Yeah. But for night one, that was our— That's pretty We cool. were ranked 109 local, New York. Wow. That's sick, right? That is amazing. I have, so some, I have, I have psychopaths here. I was going to say, really good. Again, everybody's in really good shape. Yeah. Duncan, what was your time? You, you were like— 29, 18. Were you like number seven or eight oh for the team? Oh, my No, I think I'm—last I looked, I was in like five. You were five. Yeah. Congratulations. Holy Thanks. cow. So, Hello, fellow runners. So Mike, Michael ran it in 37 minutes. I wow. ran it in 41. Wait, Stephanie, That's you don't have the background here. Josh was talking a lot <laughs> Wait. of shit. The shit I was talking was you said I couldn't run it. I couldn't. Correct? But then— But I did run it. When there's a will— Wait, do you want to apologize? When there's a will, there's a way. Do you no. want to say that, do you want to <laughs> no, say no, that no. you were wrong? That's awesome. No, I wasn't wrong. You Wait, you were right I couldn't run it? I smoked you. You, sm you smoked oh. me by three minutes. Oh my God. Three, that's a big difference. Let's not be, let's not wow, be silly. Wow, that's awesome. Why don't you just say, I didn't think you could run it and you proved me wrong? I wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be like- You the, did. No, wouldn't you that did. be the nice I, thing to say? I, no, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't think, I thought I was shocked when Josh- You're, eight, run you're eight years younger and 200 pounds lighter than me. <laughs> And I literally ran. I literally ran it three minutes behind uh, you. You Come know, on. he and I did Soul Cycle together. That's right, that? Steph. <laughs> Wait, was that on TV? <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Oh my god! They sent it us was, to the Upper West Side. Oh my god, that was <laughs> hilarious. Absolutely. I did make. I did make the whole room laugh a few times. You definitely did. You um, absolutely did. Do you know that? Was that during uh, the pandemic? No, no before 2016. Yeah, I don't know, it all blends. There together. was a producer there that. Uh, what was her name? Lydia. Lydia. She used to make us do these ridiculous things. Dude, Lydia, Lydia might be listening. <laughs> Lydia was nervous <laughs> when I did this whole cycle with you. She's like, you really don't have to do this if you're not. I'm like, what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to fall off the bike. And I literally fell off the bike. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> what was the segment where you guys had like stock fights? <sighs> oh, Jesus. We had stock. Oh, the debates. The debates. Oh. That was that, that was, was Lydia bad. era. That was really hard. But she had us go like to golf courses, and she had us. To go, she, they they came to our homes. Yeah, like, I think what do you do when you're times. not trading? That's what she did. She, well, so the first producer was John Malloy. Love yes, love John. John. Shout to John. Yeah. And then Lydia was like his apprentice, and Lydia took over. Yeah. And she she made us have a lot more fun than we otherwise would have. Absolutely. To her credit, one hundred percent. So what did you do when you're not trading? Running. Running. Yeah. And Shake Shack. Uh, kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I took my kids to Long Beach to the boardwalk. Oh, I, nice. cool. I didn't cool. know what to do. Like oh, they had a uh, nice. what's his name? Like John Najarian had everyone on a on like a private yacht. <laughs> yes. I don't have a yacht. <laughs> uh, I don't have a yacht. I think Mike Murphy had the city of New York do a fireworks display for his. <laughs> yes. So I'm like, oh, we Mike go, Murphy. we go to the boardwalk. You go to the boardwalk. I didn't That's have what any, you do. but my kids were really small yes. at the time. Well, I don't know. I remember both of ours. So the all of ours. The debates were they would pick two traders from the show Ugh. who disagreed on a stock. Sometimes they would make you disagree. Yeah, yes. yes. And they would put us this far apart from each yeah, other, no, maybe closer. No, it got contentious at times, I remember. Yeah. But imagine face-to-face, -face, no yeah. table in between, yeah. just yeah. sitting on stools. Yeah, well, you're dumb. <laughs> it was eight mile. It, it, was, yes. it was, oh, I have to tell you a funny story about that, actually. I was reminded of this today. I don't know why I didn't tell you at the time. So, one time you and I debated a stock, God knows what the hell it was. And... Somebody sent me a meme. I guess it was on Twitter or something. Back when people used to tweet, live hey. tweet about the show a lot. Yeah. Um, and it was a picture of me and you yelling at each other. <laughs> and and the meme was, someone tell Tony and Carmela Soprano to stop fighting. <laughs> I love it. People call me, tell me I like, look like her all you the get time. That? All okay. the time. Oh, I, yeah. I don't get Tony Soprano Tony, as, that's, as that's interesting. That's awesome. That's hilarious. So yeah. the, that was ugly. We actually lost a few cast members of the show over the debates. Yeah, because you just they oh just couldn't. I had I had a debate Scaramucci one time. I was like, what the oh, hell? Yeah. What the hell does he know about stocks? No offense, but yeah, what does he know yeah, about stocks? Yeah. He's not a portfolio yeah. manager. I mean, it was something. When did you join the network? I'm on my 16th year. Holy smokes! Yeah, 16. Long, long time. Oh, you predate me. Yeah, I made my first appearance at the end of 2010. Okay, okay. and then right after that, somebody called me, maybe Mary, and was like. You know, fast fast money. I'm like, yeah, I do fast money. They're like, well, we're gonna do it in the middle of the day, 
in New Jersey, and it's going to be called The Halftime Report, and Scott Wavner is hosting it, and you'd be great. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it. Yeah. And that was me, you, and I think we're the uh, Terranova. Weiss. Terranova. No. No. Three yeah. Weiss. Uh, with the Jarians, of course, yeah. at the time. Yes. Um, Patty Edwards. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Steve Cortez. Oh, Cortez. yeah, Cortez. And who's the person in Chicago, the traitor? Is oh, um, what, uh, uh, Killer? No. Jeff? I, although he was on it, Jeff too, Kilberg? for a little bit. He yeah. was on the show with us, but it was, t- was uh, what was that guy's Oh, name? did he pass away? No. no. Okay. He's just like, t- he's like this tiny. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> or maybe it's he better if tiny. we, maybe it's better <laughs> if we like, don't remember him. He's probably not. Not, not Santelli. No, not or Santoli. Not, Santoli, not, excuse me. No, not Santoli or Santelli. <laughs> but we, you know what? We 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 had fun before the show, even like before we even knew what it was. Yeah, we did. And one thing that's funny that I remember is they had people that weren't in the studio with us on a giant screen, <laughs> and they would wheel the screen up next to the table, <laughs> so it would, you would yeah. feel like you're there with them, and they would oh. just be sitting on a screen. Oh my gosh! Like they would do that for Pete sometimes yeah. when he was in Minneapolis yeah, that's or, right. or in Chicago. That's right. So. I think it's better at the NYSE. I, I do. I like. I mean, you I like. Angle, I liked Angle of Cliffs, but it was quiet. I think we were calmer. I think we're a little bit. I think the energy is a little bit more at, at the. Exchange. I agree. It's just a, such a pain in. It's, not that Jersey yeah. was easy for me, but it's such a pain in the ass to no, get to of the course. exchange it's for everybody. Yeah, for no, everyone. it's not. It's how not do you great. get there? I get a car service. I'm yeah. like, that's kind of nice that CNBC yeah. offers it. But even that's rough. It's a. It's very rough. Yeah. Like it took me the last three days because I was on halftime. The last three day, last three days, two hours each morning. Oh, brutal. To get to the this, and there's no like fast way to do it. No, no you can't. Yeah. You know? so. so hey, do we have race pictures? Yeah. Do we? I want to show. I want to show Stephanie oh, yeah. that I actually did this. I want. <laughs> I want to so show impressed. her <laughs> proof. Proof of race. Look at that. So th- uh, this is tw- this is this twenty of us. Oh, that's so cool. And um. I, I obviously uh, am in the front because <laughs> I was going to be the fastest. So I'm looking at sneakers because we're always thinking about investing. Um, I'm running an Asics. You're an Asics. I see a little bit of Nike. I don't see any Hoka's. I see a What's, New Balance. No Hoka's. I, I, I was Hoka. wearing Hoka's. You were wearing Hoka's? Yeah. I'm a huge, huge I love fan Hoka's. of Hoka's. Do we, yeah. have any, do we have any others? I got all Oh, nice. Starting line. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Do you see my face? <laughs> that's before. Are you scared? That's, wait, I just want to say that's before. <laughs> I'm not. You look pretty intense. So, Stephanie, my secret is I have never ran a three and a half mar- miles in my entire life. Is that right? I did the first mile in 14 minutes, and then I turned on Rocky, and I swear to God, I ran 10 minute miles for the rest of the way straight. That's awesome. As fast as I can go. That is awesome. I swear to God. Right? The power of music. That's me stretching. Look at you. That's terrific. That's getting getting his deviant, fanny pack above him. Uh, hiding behind a stone wall. Was it too hot? Was it hot? Was no, it, it was beautiful. Was, it, was okay? it was shady, oh, okay, and, and it was, the weather could not have been better. Yeah, right, Duncan? Perfect. Wait, have you never done it? Have you never no. been in a corporation that had a team? Uh, no. You should organize it for High Tower next should. year. I should actually. It's a really fun event. Oh, I'm sure it looks like it looks like a blast. It was a good time. Yeah, it's not, and it's not that long. You know, I mean, I know. Felt long for me. You know who we, we you know who we <laughs> saw there? Who's a real runner? Uh, Doctor David Kelly from J.P. Morgan. Oh, really? Just like randomly walking around. I'm like, is that Doctor Kelly? Because <laughs> so, he's like a runner runner. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I, I looked up his time. It was 25 something. Holy wow. moly! Wow. Really? Oh, so, so this is the funny part. So he comes up to us and he and he says this to me. He goes, you you know, you guys should really start heading up to the corrals so you can get, you know, placement up front. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think that's going to be necessary. <laughs> <laughs> There's already going to be 10,000 people coming from behind, like elbowing me out of the way. I don't need to be right in the front. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, Rob, 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 John, and I, the three of us were in the heavyweight category of <laughs> our team. We we all finished together. And, uh, hey, you finished. I says Team Brajol. We brought up the we brought up the rear. Oh for my the god, team. I love it. That's terrific. That's tremendous. But we, what's the fastest? Uh, we haven't gotten the, all the scores yet. Majuli smoked it, right? Nick Majuli. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think he was fastest, but uh, the fastest showing is Dan Larosa with twenty seven thirty three. What do you mean? Yeah. Sh- what do you mean showing? Uh, like on on their website, they're only showing. Hasn't uploaded. They're only showing time. some results. Is that why Nick is on my computer furiously trying to find this data? Because <laughs> I was the first. Yeah. <laughs> if Nick came in sixth, I don't think he'd be doing the things that he's doing he right now. He was definitely first. He's yeah. literally yeah. hacking the website awesome. to get his time posted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to give the winner something, right? Do you plan on doing the that? actual winner? Somebody did it in like fifteen minutes. In your t- in your team. Oh, no, they didn't get it. They got a pat on the back. They get a pat yeah. on the back. Yeah. No, no, you get respect. You respect. Get... You get respect. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you can give them more. Here. You can give them more than respect. That's better than anything <laughs> tangible. John, uh, are we ready? Yeah. 
Here we are. We're gonna have Sean. Sean, what was, oh. your, wait, what was your what was your time? Twenty eight something. Holy shit! Wow, wow. that's great. Right. Yeah. Impressive. What is it? One forty four. Today's show is brought to you by Public. One of my favorite things about this booming economy is the higher for longer interest rates that we're getting. I thought that we'd be able to get 5% on my cash, I don't know, six months, nine months? Yeah, doesn't it's seem here. to be going away. And just a couple of years ago, you would have killed for 2%. Now it's regularly over 5%, and it seems to be staying. So Public is offering an industry-leading 5.1% APY, zero fees, no subscription, no minimum balance, unlimited transfers and withdrawals, and a higher rate than Robinhood, SoFi, Marcus. Wealthfront, Betterman, Capital One, Ally, Barclays, Chipotle, Bank of America, Chase. This is one of the highest rates in the industry. And it can be yours. So if you want to start earning 5.1% APY on your cash, check out public.com. That's public.com. This is a paid endorsement for public investing, 5.1% APY as of March 26, 2024, and is subject to change. Full disclosures and terms and conditions can be found in the podcast description. Welcome to a very special edition, very, very, very special edition, and I'll get into why in a minute of the compound and friends my name is downtown josh brown here with my co-host as always michael batnick michael say hello 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 john is here duncan's here nicole is here sean rob dan's in the background got a lot of help with the show unbelievable people all in studio today thank you guys for hanging uh we have an extremely special guest today i've been looking forward to this really since the minute we uh we booked it and I'm going to tell you guys why in a moment. Stephanie Link is the CIO and Head of Investment Solutions at Hightower Advisors. She is a frequent CNBC contributor. In addition, Stephanie runs an equity portfolio with the Investment Solutions Group, which has $3.5 billion in assets under management. Prior to Hightower, Stephanie spent time at Nuveen, Prudential, was the CIO and co-portfolio manager at TheStreet.com. Managing Jim Cramer's Charitable Trust. <laughs> Stephanie Link, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I can't believe this is the first time we've had you on. I know. Uh, well, we'll have to not wait this long uh, next time. Hope not. I saw Cramer today in the elevator at yeah. the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. Did so, you? yeah, yeah. Uh, we still we still talk. Well, I would I we would still, assume. We still email. We're a little nicer to each other. Does he hit does he hit you up uh, questions on stocks? There's we kind of go back and forth on ideas. I'll send him a couple things, he'll come back and okay. so it's pretty cool. Now he's your pen pal. He is my he is my pen pal. <laughs> so he, either you or he once told me a story that you when you were working with him, the day started at like 4:30 in the morning. <laughs> the reason why is you were on the treadmill. He was just doing stock shit at 4 a.m. <laughs> he was at the gym doing stock shit. <laughs> oh my god! I gotta tell I gotta tell you that that sounds like a lot of fun, yeah. but also like very uh, high octane. A lot. It well, was very intense. It okay, was but very you're intense. an you're a quietly intense person. Yeah, ab absolutely. But it was a great experience. I don't think he gets enough credit for as as good. Uh, of an investor as he is. I know he's a momentum investor and I'm not. I'm yeah. a little bit more of a Garpy kind of, you know, value. And um and it was a good combination though, right? So he, we we would we would email like a hundred times a day, starting at yes, about four, four and thirty in the morning. Uh, but he had a great knack for trading. And like timing of trading, like he was a hedge, he was a hedge yeah, fund. Like right. he was so good at just like, and you know, let's take a little off here, or if something you know was up so much, you know, that's what we would do. Or if it was down a lot, he used to make me um, put together a list every morning of what five stocks would I buy if they fell five percent or more in the on the day. And no pressure, do it before the sun comes up. And then he said, <laughs> yeah, and then he made me do it if I if it, if the stock fell and and it was at the level. He goes, well, that's your level. You told me you would buy that this morning, but it made me a really disciplined yeah. investor. I don't do that now in terms of trading, but I'm very mindful of. What I don't stocks. think you're that high turnover now, no. from what I understand. No. But like that, 
that ability to recognize opportunities quickly yeah. and like have the guts to capitalize on them is yeah. like it's a worthwhile ability to have yeah. even if you don't use it all the time. Especially like why is a stock down 5%? At least that it, it catches my eye. I might not take action on it, but it's like okay, I got to go do some homework on what's going on, right? And that's what we do for TV anyway, and so that's how, what we do for running money. So how did that I don't think Michael knows the story. I barely know the story. How did that come about? So you're on the sell side first. Yeah. Okay. What do you what are you doing and how how do how do you cross paths with Jim yeah. to start with? So I was on the sell side for 16 years. And you know the sell side, no one wants to pay for research. And so it was every single year I had to lay off people, cut costs. It was just right. not a great experience. In a bear market in especially. A, yeah, and yeah. it was just tough. It was challenging. Um, I enjoyed it. I'm very thankful that I had that opportunity. But I was looking to do something different. Um, and... Uh, Jim and I have a, have a friend in common who, and they were both at the gym and, and Kramer said, asked my friend, Hey, do you know anybody that's interested in running money? Uh, my charitable trust with me and running the show. And, uh, Mike, Mike, who works for me now uh, at uh, Hightower. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's a very small world. Um, he basically introduced us. We met for 30 minutes. We talked about stocks the whole 30 minutes. At the end of that, he offered me a job. Okay. So I said, yeah, so you, okay. You it's, blew him away. It's kind of an interesting story, but let me tell you something fun. And it just tells you a little bit about Jim that maybe people don't know. Uh, so he's after 30 minutes, offers me the job. I'm like, yeah, sounds great. And uh, he's like, when can you start? And I'm like, I could start tomorrow, whatever you need. He said, why don't you take a month? You just had a, a I just had Georgia, my daughter. And he's like, have some, spend some time with her. And, uh, and then we'll hit the ground running in a month. So a month goes by and I'm having a grand time with my daughter and I'm, you know, really gearing up for working with Jim and slowly every day I'm thinking, how am I going to leave my daughter and yeah. how am I going to do this job? Right. And so I got more nervous and more nervous. So the night before I'm supposed to start working with Jim. You're going to show up there at the street headquarters? The night before. Okay. And <laughs> I said, Jim, I can't come. No. And he said, okay, for first it was like a minute silence on the phone. And that was like a long time. And I'm like, oh, what did I just do? Oh, my God. Yeah. And he said, well, why not? I said, well, um, I don't think I can leave my daughter. Um, I've had such a, such a great time with her. I, I do want to work. And I've always wanted to work and have you know family at the same time. Really hard to do, as you all know that it is. By the way, you're you're doing it beautifully, mm -hmm. and I've watched you <laughs> do, do it for uh, our daughters are roughly the same age. I, so I've I've watched you pull this off, it's and it's pretty impressive. Been a challenge, but so he said, "Well, what is it going to take for you to come?" And I'm like, "Now this is way before work from home, way before." Yeah, yeah. like oh six oh seven. Yeah, oh yeah. uh, seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, so, "So he said, what is it going to take for you to work?" Uh, f to come work for me. And I'm like, can I work from home a few days? And he said, how many days? I'm like, two. I'll come in the city three. So another minute pause. And he's like, how about this? How about you work from home for three days and you come in two? Mm. And we call it a day. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy gets You're not it. getting that deal anywhere else. No way. Not on Wall no Street. No way. Now, let no me tell way. you, working from home for for Jim Cramer was wicked hard. Yeah. Because it was 24-7, right? Yeah. And it, it always was. But anyhow, it, he has a really amazing heart. And no one really knows that. Uh, I don't think that, you know, outside I think his people. Friends. I think people know that. You don't, I mean. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think pe people ask me all the time, how crazy is he? His reputation, though, is not Twitter. Yeah, yeah. In the real world, because no. I've seen this, yeah. when people see him in real life, they get excited. It's like seeing Mickey Mouse at Disney World. Oh, I know. Okay. I know. I know. Yeah. So t forget Twitter. Yeah. Forget the message board bullshit. Yeah. I think just being in his position, unfortunately, his, uh, his like, f fortunes are going to rise and fall with the stock market. Yeah. So after a really big bear market, he's the guy that's on TV five days a week. That's when John Stewart's going to pick on him. Yeah, that's but, right. But like during a really great bull market, people love him because yeah. stocks are going up, and yeah. he's giving you amazing insight every day. Yeah. So I, I've heard Kramer on CNBC since I started watching. I don't know when he joined the network, but he always mentions every night the charitable trust here in the charitable trust. What is the charitable trust? Yeah. So um, it has it's um, it's a portfolio. Um, uh, that he manages, and it has subscribers that follow it. There's only like about a million dollars in AUM. Right. But he has 75, at the time when I worked from 75,000 subscribers that wow. pay 
uh, a fee to get access to it, to get all right. the trades. He talks about his meetings, his monthly meetings now on TV. Um, and uh, what the coolest thing about it is at the end of the year, if you made money, any of those profits goes to charity. Right. And what was what was really cool was he actually let me, he gave me half the money to, to send to charity, oh, my wow. own charities. Okay. Well, because I was co-running it with him. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's powerful in that it has subscribers and he talks about it all the time. And yeah. so it's a very concentrated equity portfolio. It's very much like what I run now. I run a portfolio that is kind of large cap core and it's 35 to 40 names. He, when I joined, had 20 names, and he didn't want anything more than 20. 20 is just too much volatility. It's a lot of vol. So yeah. I said, so I kind of expanded it to 30 to 40. But that's the max you can do if you're actually running a portfolio. Yeah, I was going to say, do. how do you, like covering 40 stocks is a lot of work. It's hard. It's hard. It's a full year, full-time job. Full-time. Earnings season is, oh a my bear, God. A bear, a yeah, bear. Yeah. And, but you know what? I mean, you can do it now with technology. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get the the research. And of course, I'm I'm very appreciative of the sell side. Even though no one wants to pay for research, I'm very appreciative for the information, not necessarily the stock picking per se. I'd yeah. do that, right? Um, but there's a lot of great information that you can learn from, and I wouldn't do any more than that, though, because I don't think I could do it well. So I met your father, who is he a— uh, still working or retired? He is. Okay, He's Merrill Lynch working. broker. He was. Like the real deal. He was, yes. So that was your childhood. You grew up watching your dad go off to Wall Street. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he was an F.A., and then he was a branch manager. He start, He was at Dean Witter. Okay. My stepmother is at Merrill. Uh, she was at Merrill Lynch. She's now at Morgan Stanley. Okay. Brother, uncle, husband, so everybody's this is in, in the, the blood. Business. This is in the blood. Everybody's Do you think you're business. ever going to stop? I'm not going to stop, but I'm not going to be an F.A. <laughs> <laughs> I like what I'm doing now. I love running money. It's a lot of stress, but so I, I like it. A few years ago, you moved over from uh, from the charitable trust, and I think you, you had a stretch at Nuveen. Yep, you were managing that, was money. That Tia? Was, yeah, yeah. It was really TIA Craft. That was, the, but then they merged and then they changed the name. Okay, so yeah. So, so you were running money there, and I remember, I remember you saying. I'm thinking about making a move to the RIA side, yeah, which you, is- You uh, my like, first call. So that's where the gravity in this industry has been moving anyway. It's been moving away from everywhere and all toward RIA. Um, and so I remember you making that decision. You chose Hightower. Um, it's one of the biggest RIAs in America, one of the most successful RIA platforms, firms, et cetera. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this uh, before the show, but just give people some idea of like your day-to-day uh, working there, managing money for yeah. the advisors and clients. Sure. So um, I chose Hightower because, well, we talked about a lot of different names, a lot of different companies, um, and it was great to meet everyone um, that I did. But I chose Hightower, A, to your point of it has size and scale, one of the largest RIAs out there. But more importantly, I didn't know anyone at Hightower. And so I decided to send my CV to the CEO via LinkedIn and said, hey, I'm exploring a lot of different opportunities and oh, would love wow. you to- cold? Yeah, cold call. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I'm like, I don't I don't really know a lot about this space, but I've been doing homework look and the firm look, sounds really amazing. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, I'm never going to get a, an email back from this guy or a LinkedIn back. Like, within 30 minutes, he actually accepted. And he said- well, you are f***ing famous. Well, I don't, like, I don't on, know if I'm famous. You are, no. you are capital F famous I don't on, know about on Wall that. Street? I don't know about that, okay. but- Fine. It is you what are. it is. I mean, it was just cool that the CEO, like CEOs are busy. You guys are busy, I was right? going to say, I really Come wish on. you hadn't told that story because <laughs> now I'm just picturing what my LinkedIn DMs are going to be like. Uh, that's, yes. an, that's, an, that's, an, that's an awesome story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we created the role. So I have a couple of different responsibilities, chief investment strategist for all of Hightower. So putting out, we put out research. I put out like macro thoughts and my thoughts in general about where we are in the economy and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and advisors, we have 174 teams and, uh, every teams vary from two, a two person team to a 40 person team. So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of assets under management, but the first, that's my, my one, number one job. My number two job is running investment solutions. And so when I started, um, four years ago, uh, the investment solutions group, which is like a, an internal asset management business. It's, it's their TAMP. It's exactly right. So any kind of any advisor that wants to send their clients money to me, that's what we do. And so we started when when I started, it was 800 million, and we're now actually up to five billion wow. in AUM. Okay. Um, and so it well, I don't know, I'm clapping, but it's been so within investment solutions, we have 
equity portfolios, SMAs, equity portfolios, fixed income, multi-asset portfolios, all right. strategies. And any advisor can decide where they want to allocate the, the money. Um, and we've got a great team. And when I mentioned Mike, who, uh, who introduced Kramer to me, I worked for Mike Shea when I was at Prudential for 10 years. He was the CEO of Prudential this Equity in Group. The in the 90s? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's fine. And he went into retirement. When I went to go with Kramer, he went. He retired. And then when I just joined Hightower, I, I pulled him out of retirement. So I've got a great team. Um, and uh, and I just love to I love to run money. And I, I said to Bob Oros, the CEO, when we decided on this role, you know, I said, you know, I have to run money because I want skin in the game because I think I'll be better, uh, especially on TV. I was going to say you're not you know? o you're not overseeing it from a distance. Yeah. You're like you're on the conference calls. Yeah. You're listening to co co companies meeting with management. You're doing all the things that you always did. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So you're and doing fact, a lot. Don't you think that uh, that TV makes you a better investor? Because you have to, you, they, they force you to kind of keep an eye on everything on a real time uh, good, basis. I think you, I think what TV does is it forces you to be a generalist. Yeah. So it's good exactly. to have specific knowledge, but you also need to have a working knowledge. Yes. Of enough of the moving pieces that you can't really be stumped. Well, they can't cut to you and you say, yeah, pass. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, no. well, it'll be, your, it'll yeah. be your final appearance. <laughs> well, sometimes, well, sometimes it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a, a stock or a sector and I'll I'll learn something, and I'm like, wait a minute, that why don't I own that? Yeah, you know. So it's really so very. So that's like after I talk about a stock, in other words, <laughs> <laughs> do you run right into the phone booth? I didn't follow and, you on a video, unfortunately. I didn't do that one. I should have. But. Well, you've had some hu you've had some huge winners, and we'll talk about them. Uh, Mike, we want to start. We're going to start with Nvidia and Apple. It seems like. Are there any other stocks that exist right now, or this, <laughs> oh my is, pretty, God. this is pretty much it, right? So, Stephanie, I'm curious to hear your take. I mean, Nvidia is it's enough already, but on Apple specifically, it had a really rough start to the year, yeah. And over the past couple of weeks, it's had a significant rebound. Is this related to some of the news coming out of China? What do you think is going on there? Why is what's why is what's driving the stock? I think first and foremost, it got hated. I mean, the sentiment was was washed out. Yeah. You had like 55% of the analysts only have buys on the name. And for so many years, you had like 100%, mm. right? So you had some downgrades. You had people concerned about China. Um, and just in general about the iPhone cycle, the next cycle. And I think what happened is we knew that China was bad, but then they reported earnings that actually were pretty good. X china And China was actually a little bit better than expected, like less bad. They're selling more phones in China than people thought. And yeah. that was that was enough given how negative I mean, everyone and, was. Well, the other and, thing is the, the, the top line hasn't grown in a while. It's been a couple of quarters. No, it hasn't. And But you see, but I think the sentiment got so negative because so you know what picking stocks is. It's, it really is a lot sentiment. of us. It is, so always, right? And yeah. everybody went on one side of the boat and, and that, you know, to me is an opportunity. Um, anyhow, China was less bad. Services grew 13%. Um, they announced the huge buyback, right? 110 billion buyback. They the increased biggest the buyback ever announced. Ever. Yeah. And, and that's actually when I was underweight Apple for a really long time. And that's when I went overweight Apple. And it's 6.5% of the S&P. So now it's about 7.5% of my portfolio, which is huge. Mm. But the cattle is being WWDC and them talking about AI. I, I don't know if it's going to live up to the hype. I really don't. But I don't care because it is coming. And you do have an iPhone 16 cycle yeah, starting in September. they're not going to not have an AI feature on right. the phone. They're going to have open AI, some sort of a, a, a deal with them. They're probably going to have AI apps and talking about that. Um, Wait, when you said the open AI deal, is it going to be similar to how Google pays to be like the default browser on Apple, something like that? It could be. It could be. But it's going to be something because there's all kinds of rumors out there right now. And they know the importance of this, of this uh, conference. And maybe it disappoints and that's okay. But again, it's coming. Yeah. So they well, are this very was, well, this good was, followers. This was the first time on a, on a call, earnings call that Tim Cook mentioned AI. Yeah. He had been very, he, like he wasn't talking it's about it at all. Uh, well, AOI. <laughs> that's how we're saying it. Uh, to your point, I remember shows where we would all be on the desk and Apple would come up and Scott couldn't find anyone to be excited about it. <laughs> and everyone owned it. Yeah. So he's like, you all own Apple. And we're all like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what you and I were talking about on, 30, on the show. Because it was like 28 times earnings, no yeah. no earnings growth, no revenue growth, no upgrade cycle in sight. It's like, what do you want us to get excited about? Yeah. Like, thank God the stock's not 120, And quite well, frankly. Is, I know. It, but 
but then when you when then you have this hundred and ten billion dollar buyback to, as your backstop while they figure out how do you get top line again and how do you get decent. By yeah. the way, they had double digit earnings growth in the in the prior quarter. Gross margins were really strong. Operating margins in every region of the world was higher, other than China, which we know. Like, that's pretty impressive in a challenging environment. They have a huge installed base. Two point two billion. I and mean, services is what a quarter of the revenue now. Yeah, twenty six percent. Exactly yeah. right, and so, that's going to grow. That's a big deal because that that's higher deal. margin. Yeah. It's more recurring. Yeah. Do you do you buy that there was the regulatory overhang? Because I don't know that I do, given that it's trading. It's not cheap. W yeah. What's it trading forward? Is it 20? 28 All right, times. so you can't say that there's regulatory pressure when it's trading 28 times earnings with no top line growth. Uh, 100%. And, but 28 is down from the historical average of 36. So it's maybe a little bit, but I don't I don't really think so. These kinds of things, this regulatory stuff, takes years to resolve. Years. And what's so the, what's the regulatory change. if they're going to have to open up the app store yep. uh, or let people – bill for things outside of the app store so Apple can't take its cut. Exactly. Yeah. Stephanie, I'm guessing you don't own NVIDIA? I do not. What? I'm curious. Do what? you want to apologize? Stop. <laughs> if NVIDIA at some point, yes. <laughs> maybe, at some point it will disappoint. Yes. Um, and people will probably, who knows what people will do. But let's just, like, what would it take for you to be excited about NVIDIA? Or is that just not going to happen? So it's too big. It's not that I'm not excited about it. It's that I try to find, we talked about everybody on one side of the boat. Everybody's on one side of the boat here. There's I mean, no bears. Heaven help yeah. investors that own this right. thing when yeah. they do right. disappoint, right? right? It's not who is the much. marginal buyer at this point, honestly? Well, sh with people, the people who threw shorts? short on last yeah. week, yeah. that that or <laughs> or upcoming split retail, right? Because when you when you do a split, you get more retail involved. So maybe that's it. But I own Broadcom and I own Lamb Research. You sell the split. It's a ten for one split. It'll happen middle of June. You like sell the day before. Oh, I, so it's, it feels so. But dude, suckery. you're not. You're not. Let me ask you. So it's two point yeah, seven trillion. Wanna, what are you waiting for? Uh, three trillion. Three. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this will get. This no. will become larger than Apple, it, one way or the other. It has to. When you have hyperscalers, the four largest hyperscalers spending 177 billion dollars on capex just this year alone. Can I also? So say, that's why I'm excited about Broadcom because they're the number two player. This, this hyperscaler term did it come out of nowhere? or If I've been under a rock, I feel like I've heard it more in the last two weeks than I've heard it. Maybe that's ever. because we've been talking about it. Yeah. We, <laughs> so I think we talk, we say hyperscaler all the time. All the time. What up? One of the things with NVIDIA that's not well understood by most people, they assume it's like, oh, they're going to sell more chips, sell more chips. They have an installed base. Sure. Once you're in that ecosystem, you are now paying on an ongoing basis for access to the software that works with the chips. Yes. Semis so as a service? Well, it's the <laughs> so it's the recurring revenue nature of NVIDIA's software business that I think most people that are like just casually while watching the stock yeah. don't understand because you hear them talking in terms of chip shipments, but it's more similar to Apple than most people think yeah. because of that embedded uh, that embedded user base, which is growing exponentially. Wait, you're saying there'll be software upgrades to the hardware? No, you're constantly paying to use the software once you are a user of the software. So it's a good look. It's a power. It's a really powerful story. I'm just my my only issue. Not really. Not with Nvidia. My at first I thought you know look I missed it, and this was a, like two three hundred points ago, right? Yeah. I thought I thought I missed it, but then I was looking for other ways to play the same theme. There are other and, ways. And if Broadcom last year AI was ten percent of their revenues, next year it's going to be twenty five percent. Right. So they're slowly gaining traction as well. And with with well with with Broadcom you get VMware now too, and so you get more software, more recurring revenue. So there's a little bit more story there. Elsewhere, not just AI. Do you worry about what I worry about, which is that at a certain point, if there's not enough return on investment for all this spending, there could be a pause. Sure. An unexpected, like, if Meta says, or actually we decided we're going to slow down. Yeah. Do other CFOs look at that and say, us too? Let yeah. me let me ask Absolutely. this. Yes. You do worry about that. Of course. And okay. you know what? How, how much are we, like, how much how is- How many years are we pulling forward? How much is meta, like, are they double ordering, triple ordering just to get the stuff? Like, we oh. know what that, what semiconductors have that as an issue. That's yeah. why they're so cyclical because you can't get it. Then everybody's that's why there's scrambling. A book, that's why there's a book to bill. Remember the, <laughs> remember the term book to, do you remember? <laughs> yes, I totally so do. I've, I've seen people say that, that, a lot of people say that NVIDIA is Cisco. And I saw, I huh. think, I think Lindsay said, hmm. uh, NVIDIA is not Cisco because when the music stopped in 2000, Cisco's customers could not pay Cisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Meta could pull back, but 
it's just, it's, it's so, how do you, how do you think about the comparisons between now and the dot-com bubble? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of companies that Cisco had as customers that were not making money at all. All right. competitive and competitive local exchange and, carriers. And, yeah, I mean, and, and crazy <laughs> valuations. <laughs> Remember, it was like multiple of eyeballs or something that we were. That, that, yes. that's, how, that's how we were valuing those companies. We're, yes, not, do, so we're not doing. That I don't now. know what happened to Cisco's revenue when the bubble popped, and I'm guessing it got cut in half. Oh, more than that. It's, it seems hard to believe that Cisco's revenue. I'm sorry, that Nvidia's revenue would follow a similar trajectory. I think it's it's because it's not just the hyperscalers that are using these chips or needing these chips. It is. It spans so many different industries. Industrials. Let me, well, industrials is certainly the way I'm playing it. So, like, I don't own NVIDIA, but I own Quanta Services. I own Eaton. I own this GE Vernova, which the spins of GE. All the spins of GE, by the way, have worked really well. But if you listen to the companies, the CEOs on the, on the conference calls, so Quanta Services says 75% of their customers are utility and CapEx, right? So, obviously, they, we pay attention to that. CEO of Quanta said... The amount of power that is going to be needed for data center, he said, is mind-boggling. I mean, CEOs don't really use that bu- jargon. He's building infrastructure for utilities. Is that yeah. driving so the utility grid, sector? So it's grid, it's EV, it's all that. So yeah, so all those things. That's a huge theme. I think that's a decade-long theme, guys. I really do. And I know yeah. a lot of people are talking about it now, and a lot of people are you know buying utilities. I'm not buying utilities. I'm buying the companies that build the they infrastructure. Look, the stocks look great. Amazing. Yeah, yeah they have all, they've all worked. Um, we could take a pause. Uh, whoever gets into office might be some changes with some of the acts that have been passed and some of the bills and all that stuff. But this is not going on. We have not spent on upgrading the grid in 50 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, and we are like, it's like every year it's a, it's a couple percent, a couple percent. That's it in terms of spend. We need to do a whole hell of a lot more. I showed you the chart of First Solar. Yeah. This this chart looks like, uh, em- it's, an imp- oh it's an Empire God. State it's building chart. It has an RSI of 86 right now. Um, but this is pure, the need for AI so related that's, power. So that's so so you can play it through NVIDIA. I'm playing it through that. Look, I mean, even John Deere, I mean, precision precision farming, I mean, they're using all kinds of chips uh, in terms of all on all their equipment. They're not gonna need people, they're not gonna need as many people, they're gonna be more productive, safer, all that stuff. But you wouldn't think John Deere is associated with the AI boom. So I right? would say so I would say this. The end user of all this AI is not the hyperscaler. The hyperscaler is a utility. Yeah, they're building it. They're building capacity. Mm-hmm. The end user is the Fortune 500. Sure. It's every government around the world, every small business in America. That's the end user. That's different from – it's it's not different from Cisco. The thing, the thing about Cisco that people forget is they had a lot of round tripping yeah. and they had a lot of vendor financing. Mm-hmm. So – and not just Cisco, but telecom – Telecom equipment companies would basically would basically make it so that their customers could buy even more stuff from them. That's right. And then one thing I was talking about that doesn't exist now is Y2K. Oh, God. Remember so, that? But we had this binge. We had this CapEx binge that went on for three years because people thought if they didn't, yeah. everything would break down. And it's not an accident that the NASDAQ topped in March of 2000, three months after the planes didn't fall out of the sky. Yeah. Now, you don't have that artificial kind of thing with NVIDIA, but what you do have is a lot of big stimulus. There's a broadband stimulus, the yeah. bead program. Yeah. Um, so I kind of – I understand why the demand should stay intact. But if you ask me what's the biggest risk to the market, I think it's that the AI build-out story falters. Yeah. Well, I, even if you it, think it's a decade long, I agree. I, I mean, I, I do worry about it too. That's why I'm trying to find other ways to play AI. Where well, you're not fully exposed. Uh, well, um, memory. You got, you know, semiconductor equipment companies. They're the memory producers. Micron. Uh, Micron Applied Materials Lamb Research. You need six times the memory for AI. Oh wow! And we haven't even begun to see demand starting to improve. I think it's a, that's Lamb Research. I think is the second half of this year story. And I th- these stocks can explode too. And by the way, they have done really well. So when I add up all of my AI plays, like okay, I missed Nvidia, but I got a whole other set series set that right. people probably don't even know what Quanta Services does, right? right? Or even Lamb Research for that matter. So right. there's a lot of ways to play the theme. I do think though. Um, I know we're talking about uh, AI, but I think equally as big in terms of a theme in technology, it's not going to surprise you, but it's cybersecurity. I mean, you know that like just last month, McKinsey did a study and 
first and foremost, cybersecurity, the attacks are up 45% year over year. You saw Ticketmaster got hacked today? Huge. They did? F 540 million users globally. Yikes. And Today. Yeah. And so, and so McKinsey, actually, I thought it was like a trillion dollar total addressable market between now and the end of the year, the end of the decade. They just upped it to two trillion. It's going to be just as AI big as AI. AI will make it much worse. Do you own any of, of those? Do you own of any course. of the cybersecurity stocks? I do. I happen to own the one that hasn't done that well, um, Fortinet. But I would suggest if you don't want the volatility, because they all have, the, some of them have good years, some of them have bad They're years. They're all high beta. They're all high beta. You take, you, you buy weakness because you don't have to trade up at all. But Or you could just buy hack, the ETF. Yeah. Or bu uh, bug is the other one, bug right? Is the other you know, one? Kramer. I, Kramer used to talk all the time about like buying the best in breed. Yes. It sounds like you don't necessarily subscribe subscribe to that playbook. I would Why, what's best in breed cyber? Probably CrowdStrike. That's what. Oh, that's my opinion. Definitely CrowdStrike. But some for people sure. would say Palo Alto. They would, and I would tell you that while Fortinet had a bad year last year, the prior two years it was the best performer. So yeah. they have good years FTNT. and bad years. It's all yeah. about like yeah, it's all about like product cycles. But here's the thing and why I think it's such a big deal. Right now, you have 50 to 75 vendors, probably more, but those that are worth something. And if you talk to CTOs, they will tell you they wanted to have many vendors because they didn't want to be hostage to one company and the price gouging and that sort of thing. So you talk to C CTOs and they're scared out of their minds that they're going to lose their job because if, they, if they don't- they're not spending enough. If they're not spending enough, but- they don't want to have a million vendors anymore. They want to cons consolidate it. And why? It's because none of these vendors are talking to each other. So nothing's really working. Well, my, well two things on that. So we spoke to George Kurtz on uh, on the compound. We've had him on it, uh, I think a couple times. And one of the points he's made is that the cybersecurity spend doesn't necessarily come out of the IT budget. For a lot of companies, it comes out of the operations budget, which is a whole new source of sure. budget. To That's one. The other thing I would say is Microsoft is now in security. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about vendors wanting – people wanting to consolidate vendors, maybe I don't know anything, but that seems like it would be an obvious uh, beneficiary Absolutely. of vendor consolidation. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, th I just think the big five are going to get bigger. Yeah, and you want to so, have yeah. one. You want to have exposure to one of them, or two of them, or just the, as I say, the ETF, because it's not going away, and it's scary. And and it's CTOs are spending on two things. They are spending on AI because they don't want to get behind the technology curve yeah, or their to. or their yeah. customers or their competitors, and they're spending on on security because they're just scared. And it's coming at the expense of hmm, the Salesforce.coms and the enterprise software. And why do you think those stocks, all of them, look like crap? Yeah, Stephanie. I want to show you a chart and get your reaction. John, can Wait, we before we move on, one more sign of the top in AI that I'm a little worried about. Mm -hmm. Sign of the top in NVIDIA. John, if you please. This is the New York Post. We love Dan Ives. <laughs> on, in, on this, I love him. On this oh, show, no. Dan Ives is a hero. Oh, oh no. But no, but it's the New York Post. But this is the New York Post. Okay. Oh, this is this page Post. six? Wait, scroll down a little bit. No. Okay. I don't think, I can't. Is this the business section? F we love Dan, but this is not great. So wait, John, I want to read the, <laughs> he looks I want to read the headline. He looks great. I want to read the headline. I'm Wall Street's best dressed man. Here's how I use fashion to help me navigate a stressful, high stakes job. Dan Ives is the man of the moment. Uh -huh. Do we sure. agree? Oh, yes. Absolutely. He has been dead right yeah, on yeah. these stocks. He, really he is has. the face of the AI Mag 7 mm -hmm. tech trade. Absolutely. For sure. This is the Madden cover. But like this is <laughs> now is. I love his I love his I love Aviator Nation. I love the Hawaiian shirts under the blazers. I love pink. So, okay. <laughs> How do you not love these guys? Mean. He's a Long Island boy too. But I, I worry, I worry. This is the business section. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I, it, what, it, wait, there's one more. Oh my God. Oh, All right, Lord. are you selling a video now? <laughs> All I'm saying is like, this is the guy and he has now crossed over. Yeah, it's like, and it's like Getting on the Baron's oh, shit. Is, on the top yeah. cover. is Dan Ives too hot? Yes. He's, he's, yes. He's hot. He's, he's so hot right he's now. He's Hansel. Hansel hot. So. But you know what? I will say this because he's told me he travels all over the world, as you guys know. Oh, he is a and baller. He talks to there are certain regions in of, of the world yeah. that have no idea how like what the the amount of information that we have here and they're just beginning like they're not even invested like Japan he was like they're not even barely investing in this theme just yet yeah. he's like I actually go and I do presentations we don't even talk stocks it's like we just talk like the concept and the and what it means and the, the long term I actually, so I actually sort of right so so when I listen to him talk he He's been saying this, yeah. and he's been right, yeah. and it's tempting to see like him in a fashion spread in the New York Post. 
as something that we'll look back at six months from now and be like, that was when you had to sell it. <laughs> Dad, don't kill me. I love you. I know. I it's it's, but it is really powerful. And you hear many, many, many CEOs yeah. will say this is told. This is the internet, the beginning of the internet cycle. Well, if that's true, then we don't need to worry about most of the things we just spent 15 I minutes know, worried about. I know. Well, we worry, but yeah. I mean, it's, that doesn't mean that you can't see a pause. And that doesn't mean that you can't see a 40% drawdown, 20% drawdown, 10% drawdown. By the way, that would prove nothing. If NVIDIA falls 30%, nobody nothing. gets to say I told you so. That's right. That's right. Because like, any stock could fall 30%. If you exactly missed, right. missed 3,000 exactly right. points yep. on the way yeah. up, you can't do yeah. a victory Listen, lap down if NVIDIA 30%. goes on 80%, okay, fine. Right. To declare victory. But until then, right. if it gets, get, cut, gets cut in half after a 1,000% th run, I know. All right, move, stop. move us along. Uh, all right, Stephanie, look at this chart <laughs> and react. For the audience, we're looking at S&P 500 components mm -hmm. and we're bucketing them into zero to 20%, 20 to 40, all the way up to the best performing stock is SMCI. This is YTD. So this, this is year-to-date okay. year return. So when you see this, mm -hmm. what's your reaction to how the stock market or how the stocks in the stock market have performed so far in 2024. Yeah, I mean, what it, what it tells me is that we're all talking about, we were talking about the broadening out in the market and you look at this chart and no, you're not really seeing the broadening out in the, in the market. You're seeing huge dispersion. Um, we had seen from October lows to about end of March, early April, you had seen, you had seen like a real broadening out. You saw financials act well. You saw an energy act well, industrials act, materials, some discretionary. I think it was a top 10 like rally over that period of time yeah, in history. I mean, but, but it's now back to net, it's now back to narrowing. So it'll be interesting to see if this news with Salesforce, is that the catalyst to say, okay, guys, we just got to take a step back and go back into other industries and sectors because that is actually on the margin has changed. Um, and I know it only because I feel it in my own portfolio, I was kicking butt uh, it, it, year to date. And then now all of a sudden it's back to the fab five, seven, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, but I do think what has surprised many people, um, and I've been talking about it for a while, is earnings came in better than expected beyond just technology and comm services. All those sectors I just mentioned, they all had really good earnings. Yeah. And they're not so bad if you look at the kind of kind of like the XLE year to date, or if you look at the XLF or the XLI, they're up about eight to nine percent. Okay, maybe tech has now kind of taken full speed in the past month. And so you're like up 12, 13 percent in tech and comm services. But these other industries, they're not slacking. And the whole reason is because the, con the economy is stronger than people thought. And no one was talking about 3.5% GDP f for the second quarter or 3.4% last year. So I want to run this. Total. I want to run my big idea by you. Mm -hmm. This is my big idea about the second half of 2024. The consumer is not dead or even dying. No. But here's what's changed. The consumer is now making choices. So from 2020 to 2023, Nobody made choices. I like this in red. I also like it in blue. Buy both. I want to take a trip. I also want to uh, buy a snowmobile. I'll do both. That's, that's what I feel like has changed. So in 2020, 2021, 2022, consumers bought everything. They did everything. They did three vacations a year. Nobody made any choices. And that's, I think, why we had such an incredible stock market rally now, consumers are saying yes to one thing, no to the other. They say, we'll do this. We're not going to do that. And I think that that explains the selective outlooks that we're hearing from all the companies that you follow, I follow. Like now you're, you're seeing for every company with a great result, you're seeing two more that it's like, oh, we're getting hurt. Now you could say, well, bad news for you, but good news for this one, because that's where the spending is shifting to. I'm just making the point that the spending was everywhere. And now it's narrowing. I think that's like a doesn't yeah. mean the consumer's dead. It just means the consumer's normalizing. Well, <clears throat> two things: the consumer has just because inflation has come down from a peak of nine point one percent to three three and a half on the CPI, it's still up twenty two percent over the last four years. So Cumul cumulatively, uh, cu cumulatively, yeah. and that's a lot. Um, now, um, so that's number one. The other thing is some companies priced. Like mad. Starbucks. So, I mean, you think of Starbucks. I'm just even going to give you Pepsi. So Pepsi, a year ago, increased prices 16%. What does that mean? Like, I like remember, on a 12-pack of cans? Yeah, I or, remember or one on earnest call. One earnest call, they said that uh, volume was flat, 
Revenue is up 11%. Yeah. And Something it's all like price. That. It's all price. So now fast forward to this past quarter, Pepsi still raising prices, but it's only up 5%, but it's still up and you aren't up from up 16 a year ago. So Are their volumes growing some, or no? No. So I think, I think that customers are just, I mean, we're hearing a little bit of trade down. Um, we're hearing a little bit more of private label stuff. I think consumers are getting a little bit more choosy to your point, Walmart especially was on the good, that. especially on the good stuff. Yeah, Walmart was saying, you know, people. I got to tell you something. <laughs> Walmart said the, con the the consumer is is consistent, consistent, and but they're looking for a value. I don't know about you guys, but I'm always looking for a value. Like, yeah, who, when, when, are we, when are we not looking for value, right? So that that I think that that quote got distorted a little bit. Um, but I would just simply say, like, it's so goods have had all this pricing in incre price increases that's starting to hurt them. Some of the services, though, are now starting to see price. Incre I mean, look at McDonald's, look at Starbucks, look at all these companies. But to Josh's point, the consumers are picking and choosing because we just had record airline travel. Yeah. And I think this chart is incredible. John, chart back on, please. We're looking at all of the components in XRT, mm -hmm. and the dispersion here is wild. Mm. So you see, on average, the XRT stock is up 2% Let's just day. tell the audience, the um, XRT is a ETF that owns retailers. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the best performer of the bunch this year, it's Abercrombie & Fitch, which is up 114%. The worst is Walgreens, but you've got stocks all over the place. Target's up 5%, while Walmart is having a much better year. Uh, best Buy is down 7 GameStop, I mean, GameStop is GameStop, whatever. But the point is that for every Nike and Starbucks, you have Dick's and Chewy and Foot Locker today was up 20%. So there's wild dispersion. Consumers are not just buying everything to Josh's point. Absolutely. And I will say, if you have the right product and you price it well, you're going to see better demand. Um, Starbucks didn't oh, price that's, it. Oh, that's simple? What? I, I mean, right? Like, if you have <laughs> yeah. the right product, you got Hoka's. Why, why aren't we all loaded up? Well, in, that's in another Denver? interesting story I wanted to ask you about. Lulu has been absolutely slaughtered. Yep. And just like looking around, you you live in in the northern suburbs of New Jersey. I live in Long Island. It's probably Alto, similar. Right? Yeah. That's the one that's killing them. Alo. Alo. Um, but if you look around, you'll see like new brands. It yep. doesn't mean people aren't consuming and Lulu is some sort of a bellwether for tennis moms. That's not what's going on. <laughs> Lulu for so many years didn't have the competition. They had none. You, they people had used athleta. to say, yeah, right. As people used to say, well, you know, Nike's losing share. Nike is not Lulu. It's a totally different animal, totally different product set. Nike yeah. is a footwear company at the end of the day. And Lulu really is athleisure. And they so, invented the category. Exactly. So I, I think that but okay. Nike competes with On and with Hoka well, and brands that didn't matter That's three right. years ago. That's right. You were talking about On millions of years ago. I was yeah. talking about Hoka millions of years ago. And yeah. it's, it is what it is. But I think I think now you have not only more competition for Lulu, you had everybody. This was one that everybody also loved and owned. And it was and they could do they no crushed, wrong. They crushed this stuff. They, and and now, you know why? The valuation, even now, is kind of kind of complex. I would just say, um, back to consumer for half a second. You can't get too negative on the consumer um, with jobs where they are. Yeah. And I look at initial claims. I don't look at non-farm payrolls. That's backward looking. Initial claims on a four-week moving average are running at about two hundred and eighteen thousand per month. Haven't budged. Four-week moving average because it's just smooth it out. Yeah. During recessions, that number gets to three hundred seventy-five thousand. So we have a long way to go before we're going to start to see the, the the labor market loosening up. We have 1.3 jobs available around this country for every one unemployed person. Love it. I know jolts have come down. I get it. I know on the margin, things are softening a little bit. Got it. But it is still very tight. And as long as that is the case, and that's going to keep wages up and elevated. And that's good for the consumer, by the way. And that's also the frustration for the Fed. So here, here's, here would be the other side of that, is that if by the time the labor market does soften, stocks will have gotten obliterated, right? Number two, uh, credit card delinquencies are definitely heading in the wrong direction. And so by the time, if, if, I'm not saying that a recession is coming, but by the time a recession comes, it will have been way too late to like then get defensive, as is always the case. 100% delinquencies are running about 2%. Actually, have some uh, some data on that back in, where it's slowing delinquencies. Is that, do, do, yeah, mm -hmm. not so, as not as not no. rising as quickly as people. So thought. Right. I'm talking about credit card delinquencies. I'm talking yeah. about that too. You're running at about two percent. I, I mean, you look. At, I'm looking at the big the big banks, the big card uh, companies, um, because I look at this stuff 
exactly to your point, everyone's worried about it because it's rising, but it's off of a very, very low, historically low base. And, you know, you go back to the great financial crisis, delinquencies are like 9 10%. So we are far better. Um, that's not to say that you're going to have not you're not going to have pockets of the consumer that's going to be struggling. The low end is struggling a bit. Maybe the mid tier is as well. The high end, you know, is doing okay because a, a, they have jobs, they have better wages, home prices are up, and the market is up too. And you have the 80-20 rule in terms of spenders. The, those obviously that are the upper end, they spend more. Um, on a, on a kind of on a marginal basis. So I'm not saying everything is perfect with the consumer, but I, that's the that's thing pretty that good I, though. it's better than people think. I, I think it is. Moynihan, Moynihan today was talking about how he sees no sign of consumer stress. Every bank is saying the same thing. It, Walmart and Target are saying the same the Wall thing. Street Almost Journal. everyone is saying the same thing about the consumer. This is the Wall Street Journal today. Delinquencies or loan payments that are at least 30 days past due really started to climb in 2023. Most people would say normalize. That fueled concern. The U.S. economy could soon hit the skids with consumers finally spending through the cushion they had built up during the pandemic. Right now, though, those delinquencies are steadily falling. The latest monthly data from Credit Gage showed percentage of overall outstanding balances of consumer debt, which is auto, credit card, home, personal loans, that was 30 to 59 days past due, actually fell to 0.86% in April, mm -hmm. down from the recent peak of 1.04% in February. So we might be splitting hairs, 0.04 minus 0.86, <laughs> but the point is it's not 3%. That's right. It's um, not a. It's not like a, a blinking red light right now. It just, it I doesn't exist. I don't think so. And then in um, kind of some, in today's, uh, some of the data that we got today in the GDP report. Can I ask, can I ask you saving, about that? Save, sure. Savings rate rose to 3.8%. Okay. This is the second, is second revision to second estimate to first quarter GDP. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1.3%. The first reading, which we got in April, was 1.6%. So lower than expected. We know they make these numbers up anyway, but just hypothetically. Um, Goldman is Goldman is, uh, is expecting 3.2% for Q2. The Atlanta Fed's GDP now is forecasting 3.5% for second quarter. So don't worry about Q1. I think a lot of it was distorted by inventory and trade. If you look at consumption, I know everyone talked about consumption came down from 2.5% to 2. 2% is what we've seen for the last eight straight quarters. Okay. So, like, no. I mean, that, that, like, not to worry on that. Plus, this number is backward looking. I care yeah. more about Atlanta Fed GDP now, although we know that that's volatile. I mean, are we really growing 3.5%? Who knows? But is it 2, 2.5 two or 3 maybe? That's better than 1, 3. Tomorrow we get a uh, personal consumption and expenditure. This is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Yeah. What are you telling people that you're expecting? And this will come out. You'll already be wrong by the time this comes oh. out. So, <laughs> Thank you very not much. Not what number are you looking for, but do you think directionally this is going to be helpful toward the yeah. rate cut? If I look at the PPI, because those those components go more into PCE than the CPI, um, I think you'll probably see something like 2.7, 2.8. Two is it 2.5? It's entirely possible. It's still higher than where the Fed wants it to be, though, at 2. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to change the narrative unless it comes in at a really, really low number. I don't think that— um, Oh, you better own NVIDIA if that I, happens. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna take, That's, they're, they'll take the Dow up 800 points if yes. they get a really low number. No, if you get a really low, low number, absolutely. So but some, I, do, I don't know. I mean, I just—look, we're making progress on inflation. Um, but I, I, I do think, going back to GDP growth, it's because we're, inflation has stayed elevated— because GDP growth has been elevated and above trend, but also importantly, that I don't think is getting enough press or attention, and I'm not really sure why. Global growth is actually better than expected. Now, I know we don't believe China's numbers, but the IMF just actually raised the growth rate for China for the full year to 5%. They put up 5.5% in the last two quarters of GDP. China did. India is going to grow 7 to 8%. The Eurozone low single digits, nothing to get excited about, but they just saw the fifth consecutive month of higher PMIs. No one's talking about this. So to me, yeah. I have I look at U.S. above trend growth, and then I look around the world, 
little better growth. Why do we think copper is up? Why do we think commodities are up? And because there's a better, there's a little bit better demand. I'm not saying that we're going to, you know, grow to the skies and double digits and that sort of thing. But I just think you have better growth. It's just naturally going to lead to a little bit better, a little bit more inflation, not better. For investors that are listening, how do you think about inevitable pullbacks? So the stock market's been doing well. Breath is deteriorating a little bit. But if we get 5% or heaven forbid, a 10% pullback in the S&P 500, how do you think about events like that? I... I do better in that kind of environment because I just have a shopping list ready of high quality, best in class, number one or number two companies, as you asked me earlier. Kramer's 100%. You only own the number one player. I'll own number one or number two, sometimes a number three if it's on sale. And, you know, back in, you know, when the markets fell, when we, during COVID, like you could get the very best company. You and I talked about, I mean, we mentioned Starbucks are having struggles now, but we both bought Starbucks during then because it fell 20% for no reason you because always of buy COVID. You always buy Starbucks down 20%. I don't give a shit what's going on. You know, it's but you yeah. buy the best in class that, it, you know, it's like yeah. they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so that's where I look for opportunities and I have a whole shopping list. Do the emails do ratchet up from Kramer in a 5% pullback? You get, like, you'll hear him. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think, you know, because he's always looking for. He wants to do stuff. He does. Down, yeah, so yeah. that's the thing. I you, love it. You know what you want to buy before it falls 20%, where a lot of people just, they don't know if, like, all right, it's down 20% and that's going to fall another 30% or is now an opportunity. How do you think about opportunity versus, oh, shit, the story has changed? Well, if the story, is, if the story has changed, it means that the economy is rolling over and hard. And employment, the thing, the number one thing that I'm watching is jobs. And if that starts to real, if initial claims start to jump higher, that's something to watch. And wor- and I worry about that. And but at the company level, I'm but curious, the, how do you think about the story yeah, changing? Yeah, like, like, right. what if, like what if a company is just failing to execute and the story of the company is changing, not the economy? Well, yeah. So, so yeah. So in the first scenario that I just mentioned, if the economy is staying strong and stocks fall, you look for best in breed and you don't buy a hundred percent position if you're falling because you just don't, you can't time it. So you buy a half a position and you just watch it and you buy it on the way down. And, and that's assuming fundamentals and it, haven't changed. And then it runs up and you didn't buy enough and then you sell it fast because it's like, <laughs> well, I didn't own enough of it anyway. That's what, that's how I do it. I don't know if you do. <laughs> but it, the thing is like, it'll, these stocks will fall and, in kind of just like in a vacuum if the market falls. Um, but if the fundamentals haven't changed, that's when the, you you buy those those stocks. So let me, but can when it, the fundamentals change, that's when you sell them. But so what does that mean? Can a company fall 20% after earnings without the fundamentals changing? Yes. I mean, I had one. I had Snowflake, for God's sakes. I mean, it was a bad, two quarters ago, it was a bad quarter. They lowered guidance. They changed their CEO, blah, 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 blah. This past quarter... They then just put up 34% product revenue growth. They raised guidance. They're still going to have best-in-class free cash flow margins, and the stock went down 3% again. And so for me, I felt better buying that day than I did when it was down 20%, even though buying oh, it down 20% is – it's you got you to gotta think, can the company right the ship? If something is going wrong – can they fix it? And that's why managements are so important. CEOs are really freaking important and the and the C-suite because if they have a proven track record to fix it, Howard Schultz, when we were buying it back in, you know, 2020, you buy that because they there was a Maybe problem. Maybe that's a big part of what best in breed really means. It's I, like, 100%. do the people running the company have a history of getting through troubling times, yes. they know what they're doing. Absolutely. I will tell you that is one of, I kind of have a process, right? Like quality on sale and balance sheets and cash flow and blah, 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 market share. But management teams are equally as important for sure. And that's why I only own 30 to 40 names at any given time because it takes time to get to know the CEOs. And when you listen to conference calls and you listen to them on TV and you can they're not going to tell you anything. We don't want to know anything illegal, but you can see their body language and then you just look at their track record. So one of the reasons that I um, that um, I recently bought 3M, well, we could talk about splits when companies split well, off stocks or Well, you nailed it, spin. but what you're describing is what I watched you do with GE. Mm. You bought that stock at a time where nobody would be <laughs> caught dead buying that stock. It was tough. What are the gains from where you bought it? It's one of the biggest winners I've ever seen you have. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, and you I'm, had deep conviction, and yeah. you talked incessantly about the management coming in yeah. here. Was the guy from Honeywell? Lar- uh, Larry Culp. He was from Danaher. Danaher, right. And if you look at that chart, it's a beautiful chart. I mean, he did such a great job. But so you you double and triple down on, you're like, no, you don't understand. Culp knows what he's doing. Oh, yeah. Management here is going to fix it. And it 
it worked. Yeah, it did. And the same thing I think is going to happen with 3M. It's still very early on, but Bill Brown was just named CEO of 3M. So they're, and they're spinning off stuff too. And I like spinning. Now, what's their problem? Off. They had some massive like class action suit. They made like they killed some people or something. No big deal. They had. <laughs> They definitely had some legal issues. They still do. They've set aside funds for that, but we have to wait. So that's an overhang. But also, they just didn't deliver. They didn't execute. So, Where's 3M so now? in come Minnesota. Thank in, you. In, <laughs> in comes God. Bill Brown. Yeah. Who's now the bucks. CEO? Who's <laughs> now the CEO? Um, he started in April. So when he was at L3 Harris. He was at L3 Harris from 2012 to 2020. The defense contractor. Yes. Yeah. And the stock went up 430 points. Uh, percent. Okay. 430% under Bill Brown. So they went out and found this so guy. So they found to this guy. Over. And now this guy is running a, a kind of a company that is in, a, not in shambles, but has a lot of issues. This guy has fixed L3 Harris. He, he's not, and he was at UTX as well. And he's a big focus on margins and free cash so flow. So you will so buy me, into a turnaround that, yeah. when, you, when you see somebody like that. Yep. Come in. I mean, it doesn't always work, but like that gives you the confidence to own a stock when nobody wants to be caught dead owning it. 100%. The chart looks good on 3M. I know, Stephanie, I know you're purely fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, technical analysis used to be like- I am used, her technician. He, she he is my technician. They used to be heretics back in the day. Do you like even consider looking at the direction of where a chart- uh, You must be aware of the only, price. Of course you I only buys do. island reversals. Oh my God. I'm, I met them. I made the most money with Facebook, but not Meta, but Facebook. When tell, it, tell island, this kid. Island reversal. Like I didn't even know what the heck it was. I showed Stephanie a Facebook chart at like $18 a share. Yeah. And I go, this is, wow. uh, this is island reversal. 20, um, it was like a gap. It was a gap down, so, yeah. a few days of bullshit, and yeah. then a gap higher, and then and it. it hit that gap, and it kept rolling, and it was just like one of the most obvious island reversals anyone's ever seen. And the f and, and I sh I showed it to her. I'm not saying you bought because I showed it to you, but like it confirmed no, what you were already thinking. No, I, I bought more. But so here's the thing: like I was talking positive on the fundamentals and frustrated because it was at eighteen dollars and no one wanted to hear the fundamental story. And then he talks about the island reversal. That's a great combination. I'm like, I got to buy more. And then I heard, it gave I heard me her more. in the corner on her phone. She's like, <laughs> Facebook island reversal, go. But so, but so when you're bullish on a stock and it's going against you, how do you maintain the conviction? Because there's like a fine line between being stubborn. Yeah. Or being confident in your assertions. Yeah, I mean, look, if the story changes, Very if the- Very confident in my assertions, <laughs> so I can help it. Who <laughs> says that phrase besides you and I Ben? I only, now I say it as a Very joke. Confident Very confident in my assertions. In my assertions. <laughs> All right. No, but wait, answer the question. How do you remain look, so I, confident in your assertions? There you go. I'm never confident. I think I'm always humbled. And I think that's the best lesson I can give to anyone. Because you can, if, I get a, if I have a 500 batting average, that's, I'm heroic, right? Mm. So- I'm trying to get everything right. I don't get everything right. If a story changes, if the reason that I bought something completely changes for the bad, sometimes ch stories change for the good, but if it changes for the bad, like their strategy at a left field, they start doing all kinds of M&A or they're, uh, they're holding on to businesses that are hurting the overall company. That's why a I like AMC spins. AMC buys a gold mine. Yeah, that's right. great. Example. Do, you <laughs> right. Have, do you have any like a, uh, mental models in terms of like risk management where like I won't let a stock, I won't own a stock if I'm down 30%, whatever it is. Like, do you have like max loss sizes? I, How do you think about that? I don't, I don't. You don't have to worry um, about that. You just average down. <laughs> never never <laughs> have a loss. That, that, that's definitely, Kramer definitely told me that. He's like, if you, when you own a stock or, or yeah, when you own a stock or you're just starting a position in a stock, he's like, you should root for it to go down. You yeah. should absolutely have all the conviction in the world that goes that. down. And it's true. But sometimes things change and sometimes the moves are, are big. I don't have companies, knock on wood, I don't have many of those. Like I don't have huge high beta names. I, I gave, the, I gave the, uh, the, the example of Snowflake. That's probably like the only one that has huge beta. I'm willing to size it properly. It's only a, it's a hundred basis point position. It's small, but you know, it, I would never make it more than two or three hundred basis points because that is that's my way of controlling the risk. Yeah, you're but not you're not looking for the, the the stocks that are moving the most. That's not your mo. No, it really, right. it, it so really like, isn't. You think about risk management through the lens of portfolio management as opposed to yeah, being stopped out of a loss. Right. Yes, absolutely, and that's why I'm diversified. But that's also why I tend to focus on large cap quality. Um, companies and num number one, number two in their market in in the in, in terms of market share and balance sheets and again all this stuff that we talked about earlier. I'm not going for the fifth position in an industry. So you're not looking for deep value junky companies. No, 
Definitely. I want, I want to do, I have like three more things I want to get to with you. Okay. We don't have to dwell on them for a long time, but okay. I know the audience would be curious. Oil. So what is your year end target for crude? No, uh, <laughs> this is a tricky area. These stocks just, there's uh-huh. so much good news for energy investors mm. that never translates into sustained gains for the stocks. So just this week, three things. Conoco announces they're buying Marathon. Mm -hmm. It's a $17 billion deal-ish. Okay. Marathon's a huge stock in the oil patch. Okay. The sale of Hess just closed. That's another stock off the market. You can't buy it anymore. And then Goldman Sachs raised their long-term oil demand forecast. That's today. It's not Jeff Curry. It's whoever the new guy is. Goldman sees significant demand acceleration until 2034. Okay, we'll be fine. With a long plateau filling out the rest of that decade. The bank upped its estimate for 2030 demand by two and a half million barrels per day. Goldman analysts have a base case that calls for a peak level of 110 million barrels per day by 2034. Um, But they include a provision for a slower EV adoption scenario that might push the peak closer to 2040. Either way, we're talking 2040. It's 2024. (laughs) So there is no lack of demand for oil anywhere in sight. There are less companies than ever that are actually out there exploring and drilling. Like, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. There are less publicly traded companies than ever that you can invest in. Why aren't these stocks up 30% on the year? What am I not understanding? On top of being down last year when the market- Had a terrible year last year. when the market was up. But they had, to be fair- Great year in 22. Terrible year last year in an S&P rally. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like the news flow is so positive and I own- like, I own a basket of these. I'm not, like, uh, I don't have, like, big positions in any of the majors. Mm. Do you get frustrated by this this group? Oh, one, one, <clears throat> 100%. What what I think about, I kind of think of energy, you got to think about it in, in a long-term horizon, anything that's commodity-related. And if you believe that the global growth is doing better, I think that it should do better, especially given, you know, what we're seeing from OPEC+, Plus, uh, what we're seeing from companies that are, they could, they're producing, but they're not producing what they could produce. Um, I think a little bit of is it, a little bit of it is um, nervousness around the election, and okay. and I think that's what's starting to creep in. Uh, but that being said, what's fascinating to me is in the past twelve months, this sector have they've spent four four hundred ninety six billion dollars on M and A. And right. what's interesting to me, I know to your point, but what's interesting about that is. Yeah, it's good for, you know, whoever's acquiring or whoever's getting acquired, but it's more important that the CEOs, they think there's value and right. nobody else thinks there's if value. they're doing these deals and no one else thinks there's value, that's interesting. And they're becoming, the the U.S. large cap companies, they're actually becoming more self-sufficient, less sufficient and less dependent on OPEC and that sort of thing. You have some companies that are building out their technology platforms. You have some companies that are building out their Permian Basin, which has, is a gold mine, quite you're honestly. A, you're a Chevron person? I'm an Exxon. Now I, you're Exxon. And then I do, uh, I have, do, uh, do own um, Diamondback Energy and Sl- uh, Slumberger SLB, uh, which has been very disappointing. It's down 18% since April. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's lousy. Yeah, it is. And I think people don't like they did an M&A. They, they did buy someone, a company that people didn't like. I'll give you a fun fact. Go. Uh, Salesforce.com was added to the Dow. They pulled Exxon out to do it. Bottom. I think, <laughs> that was. I, I think Exxon tripled. Uh, seriously. I love it. And I think Salesforce might still be the same price. So also the other thing is um, these companies all make mint money. Their, their break-evens are at like $30, $35 oil. You're at $80 oil. They're yeah. minting money. That's why they're doing the M&A, but because they can. But they're still producing. They're still I showing I still growth. feel like this group should ra- should be rallying. It should. And it's just, I don't understand. I agree. So, all it's right. It's frustrating. We'll, we'll, we'll wait on that. I want to ask you about housing. Uh-huh. Housing is a really important driver of the stock market and the economy. Yeah. It's not just houses. Yeah. This is Peter Bookvar today. Pending home sales in April fell a sharp 7.7% month over month well more than the anticipated 1% decline. This takes the index to just 0.5% from the lowest level on record dating back to 2001. The NAR stated impact of escalating interest rates through April, dampened home buying, even with more inventory hitting the market. Um, This is Bookvar. The bottom line, we have the pace of existing home sales around the slowest since 1995, and that also negatively impacts all the ancillary activity 
that takes place around the transfer of a home from one owner to another. So Home Depot, for example. So it's interesting. Existing home sales are weighing on like Home Depot is not acting well, but Pulte and a lot of the home builders are acting just fine. New new homes way more desirable than if you're going to borrow money to buy a home. Way more desirable to buy something brand new. Do you own any housing related stocks? I own Dr. Horton, and I do own Home Depot. I think housing is going to be a great long term theme. It may have it may be volatile this year because of interest rates, but who the hell doesn't know that interest rates are high and the thirty year fix is at seven, and that's not going to. But you're not worried demand? about the economic spillover from the slowest existing home sales. Uh, Back to 1995. If you think about existing home sales, if no one's leaving their homes because they have, what, we have 80% of the homeowners that have a mortgage under three. So if they're not leaving for a seven, um, they're going to stay and they're going to upgrade what they have in their homes. They're just, they're just changing what they're buying for the home because how many dishwashers do you need? They're making choices. Yeah. You know, you don't. Um, And so, but you know, look, you talked about, you talked about tractor supply today. We, you and I were on, on set. Yeah. And- you know, when you buy a home, you not only do you furnish inside, but you got to furnish outside. And then you also need to buy a car to get from the home to elsewhere. And so there's a high correlation between housing and auto sales. And auto sales are close to 16 million SAR. I mean, they're just, they're also just fine at this moment. Um, what I would say is, I think that we are uh, the fundamentals for the long term. We're 5 million homes short in the country of homes in general. We have, if you talk to any of the home builders, they have underproduced for 14 straight years. Yeah. It's cheaper for them to buy to 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 buy back their stock than to buy land. We're short so, a million we're short a million homes relative to what it should have been at trend still as a hangover from the GFC. For sure. And you have 5 million millennials just starting to buy the first home. So those are powerful trends for the long haul. That existing home sales, I understand, and they are going to be depressed. New home sales are actually up double digits year over year, believe it or not. So you have this kind of some good, some bad it's within. Weird. It is weird. But, you know, you listen to Pulte and you listen to Dr. Horton, their orders grew 55% sequentially. Sequentially. Crazy. Now, I know we're seasonally into the strong period and all that, but 55% orders is nothing to sneeze at. And that's real demand out there. So I think you have to pick and choose. And why I mentioned millennials and why I own DR Horton, because 65% of their customer base are first time buyers. And they're is that, in this. Is that right? And they're in the Southeast. Okay. And that, that's kind of a combination I like. Um, you can own Toll if you want, and, and that's the upper end. You can own Pulte too. There's plenty. I, um, I just like them, and they're cheap. I mean, they're 12 times earnings, you know, and so they're really cheap. And and I just think you have to deal with the volatility in the short term, but the long term, these are so much better run companies than they have been in the past. Can I tell you some bad news? Please. This week, we lost Red Lobster. We lost so Red Lobster. Oh, we yeah. Did. We, did. Uh, we did lose Red Lobster. Last summer, they brought back their $20 endless shrimp <laughs> promotion. <laughs> Not temporary, but as a permanent menu item. Mm. Bankrupted the company within four four quarters. No, that, that's not good. <laughs> uh, Red Lobster is. I I don't know what they're going to do with it. They'll do a Ugh. Red Lobster filed for bankruptcy on Sunday. Um, they were majority owned by Thai Union, which is a canned seafood company that was basically using Red Lobster to dump all their excess oh shrimp. Oh my god! <laughs> so if, you, if you're if you're in the market for twenty dollar endless shrimp, that's where it's coming from. Oh my god! It's a, it's here's all the shrimp we couldn't sell. Give it to the, give it to these animals. Basically, is what what their majority shareholder. Uh, anyway, some private equity firm. You know. So this was an activist. Mm. Do you remember uh, Darden? Oh sure. So this is Darden Foods owns Olive Garden, Olive Garden, and Red Lobster, and the activist fund tasted the food, <laughs> and they started yelling at Darden in a series of letters like, "Why don't you salt the water before you cook pasta?" <laughs> Which you and I read, and we were insulted by that. Like, of course, you salt the water. Uh, so they didn't salt the water because it wore out the pots faster. Like, this is the mindset. Oh. Okay. So anyway. That's great. They ended up focusing on Olive Garden and selling off Red Lobster. And they sold it to private equity slash the Thai Union Bangkok Shrimp Company. And uh, <laughs> Is that a real name? I, I'm telling you. That's the actual. Um, so, so, sounds like a cool band name. Anyway, <laughs> uh, they're done. But there's a bigger story, which is like. I don't know if there's room in this economy for middle of the road restaurant chains mm. like there used to be. Mm. I think it's fast casual, um, Chipotle and Panera. And then there's like the high end, which will always be fine. 
And then what what do you do with this? Like Arby's, is that still no, a thing? Cracker Barrel is, yeah. is troubled right now. Like the these chains are like shrinking in prominence yeah. because they're just not good businesses no. where prices are. And nobody wants to eat that. Well, right, the food's, not, the food's not good or it's not healthy or whatever. So the thing with Red Lobster is they started at a time where you could not get seafood in the middle of America. Mm. So like you, you yeah. were not eating lobster in Ohio in right. 1968. Like you <laughs> right. just, there was no way to get it. Right. So they did have, they had a thing in the early days. The The founder was Darden. That's where the name comes from. They lost their relevance and a lot of those, that tier lost their relevance because you have had some of other, these other companies that have expanded their menus and their the quality is better or, or the health is better, the you know, that kind of thing. So- and they're growing, you know? I mean, there are these bigger companies that are growing, expanding elsewhere, so there's more competition what's your, as well. What's your go-to order at, at Red Lobster? <laughs> what do you usually do? Yeah. Did you have fun on the show today, Steph? I had a ball. It was so great to be here. Thank so you, guys. So that's about the halfway point. We're going to we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna break for dinner. Come, um, I, this is like, I got to tell you one thing, and uh, don't blush or, or whatever. But when people ask me, people always ask me about other people on the show. Mm, me too. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I like everybody, so it's easy, mm. right? So I tell, I tell people like the things that I like about everyone on the show, and the thing I always say about you, which you know I think is true, of all the people that are regulars on Halftime Report, you're the person that knows the most about your stocks. You do the most research, and I genuinely find you to be like. The mo- I don't want to say the most professional among us because we're all professional, mm-hmm. but you're very like buttoned up. And if somebody <laughs> says what's going on with McDonald's, you know that situation cold, mm. and you can answer any balance sheet question, any incomes. And I think that comes through the viewer. You like you you could you could see that right. You've, I've heard you. Josh say that over the years, and it's so it's obvious to the viewers. It's so. obvious to the viewers. Thank you. So very I wanted much. to I wanted to give you your flowers and say that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice of you. I really believe that. Well, I- now you could say something nice about me now. <laughs> Duncan, do we have room? We have room. We can fit it in. I'm just kidding. We always end the show with favorites. So I know you're a golfer. Are you Mm. still playing golf? I am playing golf, yeah. Okay. Are you still running? I am still running. Okay. Tell us something about golf or running or something that you're – or anything else. Like what's something that you're into that maybe the viewers should know about? Well, I would say – on running, you know, you know this that I run on a treadmill because many years ago I had a stress fracture in my hip, and I can really only do a treadmill, which um, is kind of a bummer. But I watch sports uh, on a time. Oh, I know you're, time, you're like a football on, fanatic. On a, on a I know time that. I've, I got to get home to the Rangers. Are you kidding me? Okay. Um, so I tape everything. And um, because you can't, you know, there's so many things to, to watch. You have to but turn the, off all your alerts too, though. But the problem is, is, right. is, that, is, is that I'm always a day or two behind on sports. And so whenever we get to the set, one of you guys or gals always asks, can we talk about the Rangers? Can we talk about the Jets? Yeah, yeah. Can we talk about, I'm like, no. no. We cannot. <laughs> so um, I, I find that it's it's fun. And, oh, so, and, you are, so you'll DVR the game. Yeah. You'll jump on your treadmill the next morning. Yes. Oh. Smart. So look at you, multitasking. I can't. I can't stay. Can, who's staying up for the Ranger game tonight? No. It's like it, it, if it go overtime, it's well past eleven, right? And so that's wait. So this has been a pretty great run for the Rangers. Sure has. Okay. I don't think that. I don't. Are you I Jets or Giants? Are you Jets or Giants? I'm Jets. You are Jets. I am Jets. Why? I don't know. Okay. I babysat Phil growth, Sims' growth, kids growth growth at a reasonable so price. You can't choose who you were for. It's, it's passed down. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, no. Everybody's Giants in my house. Oh. What are you? you What's too? wrong with you? I know. I'm a, I'm a Giants Giant fan. Jay is a Giants fan and you're a Jets fan? No, Jay is a Cowboys fan because oh, he's from oh. the South. I know. Oh, I don't know that. Okay. Well, there's no rivalry, Cowboys, Jets. <laughs> no, there isn't, actually. Not at all. Both terrible. All. Yes. In, so. their own, in their own ways. It, it, yes, they definitely are. The Cowboys so. at least are terrible in the postseason. The Jets are terrible <laughs> starting in preseason, and it doesn't get better. Well, we have to finger our fingers are crossed for this year. Okay, I don't all know. right. We'll see. We're, Michael and I are Michael and I are Giants fans. You're Giants fans. Um, um, Michael, do you have a favor tough, for us? You're gonna take the you're, Giants. Can be terrible this year. Yeah, we're that's okay. Be tough. That's okay. We have what no ex, they, what, we have no they, expectations. What did they do with the draft? Why did the, why did they not draft a quarterback? I don't think they liked anybody there. I'm happy we didn't take. I, I'm, I'm not a college football guy, so yeah. I don't really know JJ McCarthy's game. But yeah. I've seen him once. I didn't like what I saw. Yeah, no, and yeah, hmm, I guess I don't know. Why you think that's what they should have done? Yeah, I do. Because hmm. I just I don't know. I, I don't know. You you guys have confidence in your no, quarterback? No, no, no. This is last season. This yeah. is last season. Yeah, that's true. I, I think you have more things wrong than just the quarterback, I so sure it almost do. wouldn't have mattered that much right now. I think you're right. 
So, it was just an, it was an odd choice, a little bit of an odd choice, anyway. So we can't all be, we can't all be Eagles fans. So so is the Jets. The we, Jets. we could have a year off. It's okay. We had last year off too. It's, it's okay. been a couple of years off. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I watched. Uh, anybody see Tires? Did you watch Tires? Duncan? I didn't start it yet. Shane Gillis, right? Sean, Sh- 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 you liked it. Yeah. Sean, did you like it? Yeah. Um, I think it was like a B minus, but what I liked about it, it's twenty four minute episodes. Perfect. Oh. So, and it's only six episodes, and it's it's basically like a movie. Mm. So it was light background, funny ish. It was good enough. Huh. Good enough. <laughs> Part what? Description. It's good, right? Yeah. Like that's was, your recommendation. I mean, that's what I watched this a week. B minus, and I, it's short. Listen, it was I'm not light. F-ing doing homework for the show. That's what I watched this week. Funny ish. It was good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I could say nothing. That's what I watched this week. It was good enough. Um, I rewatched Aliens. Best movie ever. It's a perfect movie. Aliens. Sigourney have not, Weaver. Have not seen Literally it. one of my favorite movies of all time. Seriously? You've never seen it? No. Not the first one. The second one. Really? The first one was not as good as the second one, which but is But for 1979, it was like year adjusted. It was amazing. The first one? Yeah. Uh, 100%. Year adjusted. Yeah. No, but two holds up. If you put huh. if you put two on Netflix, where I think, where did I watch it? Oh, big time it holds Not up. on Netflix. Maybe on huh. Max. So Romulus, there's a new one coming out over the summer. I think it's over the summer. I can't wait. Um, it was a part, it's like a flaw, it's a flawless yeah, movie yeah. and it takes place in the future and those never hold up well when you actually get to the future. Mm, so good. Yeah, but yes, this, true. But this one really did. That's so, interesting. Uh, I forget, it's on one of the streamers now, which is why I came across and watched one it. One of my all time favorites. I didn't like seek it out, but I was like, yeah, don't, don't apologize. You yeah, can the seek Knicks, it, you can seek the it Knicks, out. The Knicks got knocked, no, the Knicks got knocked out and I was just going through the apps and mm. I watched and I said, oh shit, I don't think I ever really watched this all the way through. <laughs> this is a good movie. Get away from her, you bitch. <laughs> oh, you know who's in it? The bad guy is Paul Reiser. Great bad guy. Oh, about you. Yeah. Great bad guy. Under, He's a good bad very guy. Very underrated. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. He's because he's sleazy. You can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He's like a corporate, like, he's, I don't, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Yeah. Anyway, per- perfect movie. Bill Paxton. So, yeah. That's great. Um, That's awesome. Do you know all the directors of Aliens, like, went on to become the greatest director? Like, Ridley Scott directed the first one. I think James, James Cameron, Cameron directed so, the second James one. James Cameron oh, did Aliens. really? Yeah. Yeah. And then wow. the third one was somebody else. It that, was Fincher. David Fincher. Yeah. So what a what a great series! Yeah. All right, Steph, we've kept you here long <laughs> enough. I know you have a reservation at Red Lobster that uh, you're gonna run to in uh, the suburbs of New Jersey. We uh, we had so much fun hanging out with you today. We would love to have you back. You want to come back sometime? I'll be more than happy what are you doing to tomorrow? Do so. <laughs> tomorrow, right. we, we will absolutely have you back. And thank you so much for sharing uh, stories from your career and your favorite stocks and just Thanks. hanging with us. You are the best. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank for you. Me. Thanks everyone for listening. We appreciate you. Make sure to leave a rating and review. They go a long way. Shout out to the whole Compound Media team for another job well done this week. Hey, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you.